Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Well, folks, it's 2021, and we have made it. I hope you all enjoy some restful and relaxing holidays, and you're ready to kick off 2021. Now, for us, our 2021 is not quite up to the start that we had planned. And for any new listeners, we full-time RV. So the next statement will make a lot more sense when you know that. We brought our rig into the shop on December 10th, and we still don't have it back. Not sure when when we're going to get it back. We have (laughs) some work that needs to be done that, of course, takes longer than anticipated. And as with life, we're trying to lean into the positive, a little bit of the silver linings. And luckily, we have a place to crash. We're at my dad's beautiful house in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And We don't have to pay any rent. So, hey, we're saving money. There you go. There's the silver linings. But here's to hoping we can get on our way to Texas and then out west soon. One of the things that I'm leaning into this year in 2021 is expanding my resilience training. So I've been doing it for quite a while. And last year, of course, brought a lot of people wanting to learn about resilience. So I'm doing two new things this year. One is creating a self-paced course. So you or your employees could go through on their own, kind of on demand. But secondly, what I'm doing to make sure we keep some of the connection and social connectedness alive is I am running a four-week session on resilience. So it's an hour each week. And I'm going to do it open enrollment style, meaning you can send one, two, or however many of uh, your employees that you want to send through. And so everyone is going to look at the content on demand first, and then we are going to come together and we're going to do a lot of small group discussion. So people are going to break out in Zoom rooms and be able to talk through some of the concepts and learn how to apply them to their own lives. And that's why I wanted to also bring together people from different workplaces, because when I do train workplaces, obviously they feel like they can't say everything they need to say in front of their fellow coworkers. So what I am really wanting to encourage is open dialogue between people from different industries, different states, different countries, if you will. And so I'm really excited about this new approach and this new concept. You can learn more on my website, and I'll link it up in the show notes on my resilience page. And it's going to start mid-February and run to mid-March. So that'll be the first session. The price is going to be $125 per first employee and then $75 per subsequent employee. And, and what I tried to do is also kind of cost share it among employers. So instead of an employee, one employer paying me a flat fee for facilitating just for their employees, they can send people through at a less expensive rate. So uh, again, I'll link it up in the show notes. But if you are interested, feel free to reach out or check out that webpage. Now on to today's guest. I was introduced to today's guest, Dr. Michael Orlowski, by friend and colleague, Diane Bishop. Michael wrote a blog that I'll link up in the show notes, and it was titled Reimagining 2021. And I just love the questions he posed to help us sort out what we want for 2021. Let me tell you more about him. Dr. Michael Orlowski's life's work and passion is creating allies for a healthy world. A psychologist with over 25 years of clinical work and professional contribution in the field of wellness and health promotion since 1978, he is one of the key developers of the field of health and wellness coaching. His company, Real Balance Global Wellness Services, has trained over 10,000 coaches on six continents. A pioneering developer of the field of wellness coaching, Michael was a founding board member of the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching, establishing standards and credentialing for the profession, and is now a board member emeritus. He's the author of several books, Wellness Coaching for Lasting Lifestyle Change and Masterful Health and Wellness Coaching, Deepening Your Craft. He's also an avid outdoorsman and 30-year practitioner of Tai Chi. Him and his wife, Deborah, live, work, dance, and play in Northern Colorado. In today's interview, we start off with Michael walking you through the ways you can create the outcome you want to see at the end of 2021. We talk through what a health coach does that people they attempt to help, including those who have been sent to coaching by their employer and aren't quite ready to make a change. Michael explains who makes a good health coach and what a health coach needs to refer out to a therapist. He explains the credentialing process for coaching and what employers can look for when hiring a health coach. And of course, as always, he leaves us with a tangible tip. But before we dive in to my interview with Michael, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, 
Workplace Money Coach. Workplace Money Coach's Living Paycheck to Purpose Financial Empowerment Program leads participants through thought-provoking activities and interactive discussions that help to cultivate a mindset around money so they can continue to thrive in their financial lives. In order to serve your employees in a safe and healthy way, Workplace Money Coach can provide programming and one-on-one financial coaching in a live social distance setting as well as a virtual option. Here is what participants of the Living Paycheck to Purpose program are saying. Shane at Workplace Money Coach was an impressive vendor from all aspects of professionalism, quality, useful, valid information, and facilitation. All around, this was a great experience, both as a coordinator and a participant. Here's what Isaiah wrote. This was probably one of the most important classes of my lifetime, and it couldn't have come at a better time. With this pandemic and social distancing, giving many of us just the time we need to sit back and evaluate our expenses and where our money has been going. I, for one, will be putting everything I learned into practice in some form or another. Thanks for everything. Now, as a bonus to their Living Paycheck to Purpose program, Workplace Money Coach is offering my listeners, you all, a complimentary coaching session for all participants of the program so employees can get individualized attention for their financial situation. Just mention that you heard about the program through the Redesigning Wellness podcast. Workplace Money Coach has trained facilitators across the country ready to help improve the financial lives of your employees. You can learn more about Workplace Money Coach's financial empowerment program and schedule a call to see if the Living Paycheck to Purpose program is right for your employees by visiting WorkplaceMoneyCoach.com, which of course I'll link up in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Michael Arlosky. Thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, corporate wellness consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Michael, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on today. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I know at the time of this recording, we're still in 2020, but by the time that this actually airs, it'll be 2021. And I know a lot of people are just ready to say goodbye to 2020, (laughs) even though, I mean, if we're going to have a little few rough months, right? And I loved your blog article, which I'll link up in the show notes, but let's do a little coaching. Why don't you walk us through some ways that we can reimagine 2021? Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know... I think for most people, anytime we come across uh, our calendar new year, there's a sense of optimism, a sense of, well, you know, this year has to be better than the last year, or I hope it is. Uh, All that kind of hope and desire is there. And something that we've um, talked about in coaching forever is we have to have more than just uh, hope and wishes. If I can be just a little crass, there's an old expression from um, somewhere in Appalachia that says, you can put wishes in this hand and spit in this hand and see which one fills up first. (laughs) (laughs) So we have to do a little more than just wish and hope. And one of the reasons I was inspired to write that was, uh, like you're saying, I think so many people are going to be very happy to see 2020 in the rearview mirror for, for many, many reasons, as we know. And something that we've been doing in coaching for a long time is helping people create the future that they want. You know, uh, I was just reading a fantastic uh, introduction to a fantastic book uh, called Civilization. And the author was saying, there are many futures. There's only one past. So, you know, we really have to study history and, and learn from it. But when we think about there's many futures, that's really interesting. Now, there's a lot of philosophers that will say, well, you know, we create our own reality. And, you know, to a large extent, we do. You know, I'm I'm totally willing to give people a lot of slack here, though, because I think outside forces certainly have profound effects on us, whether it's environmental and social determinants of health, or whether it's uh, life events, world events, like we've seen with the incredible pandemic. But um, our response to it is is what's critical. 
And as we anticipate a new year, why not set ourselves up for a more positive outcome? And that's what kind of uh, inspired me to, to write that blog. So what are some ways that we can set ourselves up for a more positive outcome? And it also seems, I guess I'm more of the mind of expect the worst, hope for the best, but expect the worst. So how do you balance the reality that we're in, right? Mm -hmm. And optimism and how do we set ourselves up? Yeah. Well, you know, there is some wisdom in the prepare for the outcome you don't want to see. I, I think uh, <laughs> I think that's why we had the toilet paper hoarding that we saw this year. <laughs> I heard it's continuing, which makes me a little scared because I'm yeah. ne- never one to go get it. <laughs> oh goodness, I'm an old Boy Scout type of outdoorsman that's that's always going to go into the woods with my uh, compass and pocket knife and all that stuff. But I think what we really have found is that when we instead imagine, or maybe in addition to Imagine the kind of outcome we want to see. We're a lot more likely to get it. You know, um, remember good old Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, probably one of the biggest nonfiction bestsellers of all time, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure you you know read every every word of it. Yes, I have read it. Thank you, and I refer to it. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Well, remember one of them is begin with the end in mind. That's one of those seven habits. And it's setting up, you know, what kind of year do I want to have? So something that uh, we sometimes do in coaching is have someone do what we call a future self fantasy, where you just relax for a minute, close your eyes and, and just imagine like you might right now. It's December 2021 instead of December 2020. And you're sitting there and you're looking back on the year and you're realizing here's what I'm really glad that I did to make this the best year possible. Boy, I'm really glad I did that. And I'm really grateful for this that I realized about that year. And You know, when I look back on that year, I'm really glad that I did certain things for my own health, for my own wellness. And I'm going to ask myself, okay, what am I glad that I did for others in this last year? And did I discover some new meaning and purpose in this last year? And just kind of ask yourself questions like that, where you really kind of look back and say, yeah, you know, I'm really glad that these are the things I did. These are the things that I did to make this a healthy, well, prosperous, rewarding, fulfilling kind of year. And get in touch with those things. And... Then, you know, kind of reflect on that, maybe write about it, kind of summarize it a little bit, and then plan to do that. Plan to make those things part of 2021. Now, I like to say um, we imagine, then we fantasize, then we plan, then we actualize our plan. And I'm guessing you have to you have to have a plan. Right? Yeah. You can vision all day, which I think is fantastic to get you kind of in that future self. But then I'm yeah. assuming you then have to start planning it out. You know, m- many years ago, back in the 80s, uh, being an outdoorsman, something that I really, really wanted to do was have a big, long, huge trip to Alaska. And... My wife and I, at that time, were fortunately on uh, more academic uh, schedules where we had a lot of time off in the summer. And I just, for years, had been fantasizing, you know, going to Alaska and seeing, you know, Denali National Park and just seeing the wildlife and the culture and maybe getting in some fishing up there and seeing the wilderness areas and all that. Fantasized about that 
on and on and on. And then started planning, started making it a reality. And, you know, did a lot of work on the planning, finding information, and then uh, took a 52-day trip all the way from Ohio to Alaska and back, 10,000 miles of, tra- of driving. <laughs> Had to see a chiropractor and massage therapist after that. But, uh, <laughs> but it made it happen. And I realized, you know, the power of imagining, but also the power of planning. And that's something that coaches really assist people in, is transferring all that, like you said just a minute ago, uh, we can vision all day, but how do you put, like my wife would say, how do you put legs under it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you use that example, Michael, because we were talking about driving to Alaska uh, this summer. So we'll have uh, to talk offline about some some things that you've learned. So that is, uh, as long as Canada opens their borders to us to get across, that is uh, something that right. we're thinking about. So yeah, planning would need to take place next. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I read when I was doing my research on you is that you say that attitudes and beliefs drive behavior. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, you know, we might say attitudes, beliefs, and and emotions, you know, the feelings that we have, which are all partly determined by our attitudes and beliefs, but also our own emotional reactions, which even get to a very visceral level. But yeah, you know, think about it. It's, it's often how we frame things that uh, cause us to decide to behave in this way versus that way. Something health wellness coaches are often working on with people is helping them to be really successful at managing an illness. And a lot of that means being medically compliant, adherent you know, to a treatment program and so forth. Taking medication, for example. So let's say that you're a person who has a chronic illness and you have to have some medication that's going to help you manage that uh, much more effectively. And you also have a brother-in-law who had a reaction to that medication. Okay, Now, he was one of the, what is it, like, you know, one out of uh, 10,000 people that had a reaction, but he was one of them. But now you have a belief about the danger of taking that medication, even though the odds are 10,000 to one that you won't be like your brother-in-law, it still inhibits you from taking that medication regularly. And, you know, there's many examples like this. The fears that we have, the hopes and expectations that we have. You know, we we can have a positive hope or expectation that can be very self-defeating. You know, we see that all the time. What do you mean by that? Someone gets a, um, a real difficult challenge in their life, or let's say a health challenge. Um, let's say that they, uh, they had a heart attack, for example, and their doctors you know, and treatment team just lay down the law and say, okay, so overnight you've got to change to a Mediterranean diet, quit smoking, and manage your stress better, et cetera, et cetera. And instead the person says, oh, I'll be all right oh, I'll be okay. You know, I've made it this far and, you know, I've always been strong and healthy and tough and blah, blah, blah. And they don't do anything to change. They're just laying it all on that hope. So that can work against us. Got it. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you mentioned health coach a few times, and there's a lot of coaches out there, right? And there's a lot of kind of certifications in a minute. You know, there's health coaches, wellness coaches, life coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's coaches galore. Right. But what does a health coach do, and what do they help people with? Yeah. Well, health and wellness coaches, and and by the way, the words are interchangeable. I was one of the founding members of the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching, and one of the things we decided early on was that the use is so inconsistent from one organization to the other that uh, we just decided to make them equivalent, and for the most part, they are. Uh, what they do with people, really, is they become an ally for someone who wants to accomplish uh, lifestyle improvement, who wants to live in a healthier way. 
And that might be someone who wants to continue to be healthy and well and have a plan to stay well. Or more often, it's helping someone who's already perhaps having some sort of health challenges, some sort of at least warnings, maybe high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia or something. But it may also be someone who has already spent years uh, battling a particular chronic illness from COPD to diabetes to heart disease to whatever it might be. And what we know is that lifestyle affects the course of an illness for better or for worse. And with a health or wellness coach, what you can do is have someone that helps you really take stock of your wellness, your health and your well-being. You know, what do I know about my current health status? Uh, what strengths do I have that's going to help me manage my illness or maybe even reverse it? What, uh, what do I have going for me? And what are my challenges? And then after we're real clear about all that, we start to imagine, okay, what's the best life possible for me? And how can I get there? And what has to change for me to get from where I am to where I want to be? And that becomes what we call a wellness plan that that person puts in place that they choose. The coach doesn't choose for them. This is extremely client-centered. Uh, all coaching is really foundationally built upon the work of Carl Rogers and client-centered therapy, really. And so that person now has an ally to help them execute that plan, to help them be accountable to themselves so that they actually follow through and do these things, to help them overcome the internal barriers of attitude and belief and the external barriers of lack of support or circumstances that are challenging to them living in a healthy way. So does it have to be somebody who has an illness or a chronic disease, or could it be someone who is typically well, but just wants to kind of amplify their, their health a little bit? Oh, yeah. Like I was saying, uh, a great line that I teach uh, coaches, uh, you know, through uh, our company, Real Balance uh, Global Wellness, is when someone is doing well, you know, ask them, okay, that's fantastic. What's your plan to stay that way? Because without awareness of your lifestyle, you're just leaving it to chance. And, you know, the average American, for example, gains about two to two and a half pounds a year. And that's just weight. You know, there's other factors, of course. And, you know, in 10 years, what do you got there? And we all know how easily things can shift, especially just because of the pandemic, right? Like, <laughs> things can change, right? Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the uh, blessings in disguise, and horrible disguise, but uh, one of the blessings in disguise of this has been a greater awareness of our health and not taking it for granted, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, having a strong immune system that you know, might not at all prevent us from getting uh, the virus after an exposure since it's a novel virus, but it may help us tremendously in the way that we react to it and cope uh, with our uh, with that health challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's definitely shine, shined a, shown a spotlight on well-being in general, yes, and, and our health mm -hmm. and immunity. So this question, so organizations can bring in a health coach and mm -hmm. sometimes, at least if the, there's kind of an, an, a traditional way of doing things it you know you go see a coach and then you get credits right so talk about the reluctant um, client the person who comes in because they have to oh yeah is, is it worth it for i mean the health coach having to to interface with that person but also organizations putting people through mm -hmm. that situation or scenario yeah, you know, we run into this a lot. A lot of the coaches that we train end up working in organizations where there's a, a, a company incentive uh, to, you know, try to help their, their employee population be healthy and well. And sometimes part of that incentive is going to see the health or wellness coach. And so the person is there to get the 10 or 20% discount on their health insurance, for example. That's often one of the big incentives. Without seeing the coach, you don't get that. 
And so you kind of have that person coming in with their arm twisted and usually quite resentful, not very happy to be there. And that's where the coach really has to really work at connecting with that person and being their ally, helping them see that, hey, you know, I'm here to help you get that discount you're looking for. I'm not the enemy. So I'm here to help you do that. Now, when, when you talk about reluctant clients, sometimes um, it, it's due to that incentive. Sometimes it may be due to kind of what you might call a forced referral, where they feel like, you know, their, their physician or their spouse or somebody has, you know, been the one tw- twisting the arm. Mm-hmm. And in those cases, I think the reluctance often comes from a low sense of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy, you know, is really that level of confidence that we have in, in two things. One, that all this health and wellness stuff will make any difference anyway. And number two, that we can actually be successful at accomplishing these things. And for a lot of people, they've had so many failure experiences that their self-efficacy is really low. Their confidence is just, you know, rock bottom. And so they don't appear to be somebody who wants to be well. The reality is, of course, everyone wants to be healthy and well. So I guess I'm, I'm sorry, I was pondering, I was thinking through this. and. I'm trying to think of asking this in a way that that makes sense, but is it ever just a case of they are just not ready to go there? Like it's, mm-hmm. it, they're just not ready to tackle that challenge. Because I'm just thinking about all the things that I could do to enhance my health. And some I'm just like, I don't have the capacity for now. Like it's just not the time in my life that I want to tackle that. Is that one and the same when you're talking about the low sense of self-efficacy? No, that, that's, that's getting more into... Uh all the work that James and Janice Prochaska have done around uh, readiness for change, stages of change. And I've, I'm good friends with the Prochaskas. have done a lot of work with their methodology and their, their theory and blended it into our coach training tremendously. And what we have to understand about readiness for change is people are not a light switch. It's not like the entire person is either ready to change or flip, not ready to change. The way that we talk about that is that, number one, there are stages of change for every different behavior. I mean, think about it. You probably have friends who they're ready to experiment with their diet, but they're not ready to start exercising. Or maybe they're ready to do both of those things, but there's no way they're ready to quit smoking. And we have this kind of action model that is a real misnomer, a a real misunderstanding. What the Prochaska's research, and believe me, everything they say is backed up by a ton of research. They say that when it comes to any particular behavior, 80% of the folks out there are not in the action stage. They are either in the pre-contemplation, I don't want to think about it stage, or the contemplation stage, where they're thinking about it, considering it, but they're not ready to move yet. Or maybe they're preparing to change, but they're not there yet. So 80% of the time, they're not up into that action stage, which is, of course, where all the healthcare professionals and people that care about them want to see them. You know, we want you to quit smoking now, not, not <laughs> right. uh, somewhere down the line, right? Mm-hmm. So what we've got to do, our job, is not to coach the little 20%. It's to coach everybody. And there's ways to coach people that are not ready to help them become ready. And that's where we have to really, really do our coaching at a more sophisticated level. And 
what do you do with things that come up? Because oftentimes, it, you know, we've mentioned a lot of very uh, physical things, right? We did chronic illness or diet or exercise. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times there's other things, right? There's oh, sure. uh, relationship problems or, or, you know, they don't like their job, or like all of the emotional mental components. So how do you address those that, that, are, that have to come up whenever you're talking about some of these other uh, more kind of physical based behaviors? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's definitely all part of it. Um, you really have to coach the whole person, not just um, have this, you know, fitness trainer, diet and exercise type of approach. And, and one of the things that, um, that we're always uh, emphasizing is that a good health and wellness coach does not have to be an expert in all the how to's of what to do. They're more there to help the person with how to do it. So you don't have to be that expert and, you know, here's the exact things you need to do to eat right and here's the things to do to exercise right or, you know, whatever it might be. But what a good coach is able to do is help the person see how they can do that. And what often is a big factor in all of that and the decision whether to work at change or not are all these other sources of stress in the person's life. And that may be difficulty with a supervisor at work. So a coach may, you know, even a health and wellness coach may engage with that client and really exploring that, helping that person to really look at it from different perspectives. You know, often we get locked into just one perspective. You know, my supervisor is, you know, an idiot and doesn't understand me and, you know, can't do anything about it. Well, when people feel helpless, Um, they end up feeling hopeless and they feel really stuck and they are really stuck, you know? So what we might do is have that person really shift their view of the whole thing. A coach might say, tell me about your supervisor, but I want you to do it in a really strange kind of way. I want you to be your supervisor for a minute and tell me about you. (laughs) What do you believe your supervisor would say if we were to ask him, you know, what, what are you like to manage? And it often ends up shifting perspective, helping that client to say, well, you know, I guess my supervisor is under a lot of pressure from that uh, terrible CEO we have up above him or her. And um, also, yeah, you know, I can be really pretty darn stubborn and difficult and so they might start owning some of their own end of it. And suddenly there's, there's hope for progress in that stuck situation. And that's just one example of how a coach might help a person to look at something that seems chiseled in stone and realize that it's written on paper with a pencil and you can erase it. Yeah, I love a good perspective shift. <laughs> that is, yeah. I think that's a very powerful just to put yourself in the other person's shoes in that, in that way. I love that question. Mm-hmm. You mentioned a few, so I think you've answered this a little bit like throughout the conversation, but who makes a good coach? And, you know, one thing that you've said is you don't need to be an expert in all the right. things. And I think that's where a lot of times wellness professionals get stuck trying to be the expert in everything. So who, who makes a good coach? You know, I would say, first of all, someone who finds themselves to be just kind of naturally empathic, you know, they just have a sense of, yeah, you know, I can take on a a look at that person's life and imagine what it would be like to be them and kind of get in touch with it. I can do that relatively easily. I've kind of got those qualities of warmth and genuineness. I'm I'm not... um, I'm not trying to just get ahead no matter what. I really care about myself, but I also care about others and and just kind of always have. So I think there's just kind of this natural ability to to listen to that other person's point of view uh, and, and to just plain listen, to realize the power of that. Uh, I think... Um, a good coach doesn't have real high needs for control. You know, there's some jobs where having high needs for control is probably a a great thing. A scientist that has to have precise 
measurements and variables and, and uh, understanding of a process. But here, uh, needs for control can kind of get in the way. I, I loved a poster I saw one time. It had a picture of somebody, you know, somebody's feet sticking out from a lounge chair, relaxing at the beach, and it said, relax, nothing is under control. <laughs> well, you just made me laugh with that control because I, I, I do like control personally. Um, but I know that also that tends to be a quality I've seen in wellness professionals because, you know, a lot of it involves planning and programs and participation. And, you, you know, people want to see this, this big change. And with coaching, that's just not how it happens, right? It's, but it can get frustrating when you don't see progress Oh, yeah. in somebody, right? So um, I love that you pointed that out. But before you go through the others, is there ever any frustration when people don't change or oh. move? Oh, sure. I, th- I think something that we, we always have to deal with and take a deep breath on sometimes is the self-defeating behavior we see people locked into. Mm-hmm. Or a coach may do their best to equip someone with all the equipment they need to climb the mountain in front of them. And, you know, you're partway up the mountain. And for what to the coach seems like a tiny little challenge, the person is turning around and coming back down. And, you know, we always try to imagine um, other people's behavior by imagining what I would do in that situation. (laughs) And, you know, I might be halfway up that mountain and say, well, well, damn it, we're just going to keep on pushing here, you know, and just a little further, then it'll get better. But my client, that's not where they're at. To them, that difficult terrain ahead seems horrific. And to me, it seems like, eh, tough, but eh, no big deal. And that's a real problem for a coach if we are always projecting our view onto our client. We have to really be patient turn around, look at it from their point of view, and realize that that challenge that we estimate at a moderate level, our client may see as a a terribly difficult level. So we have to be willing to dance in the moment as the way that coaches are always talking about it. So we have to be flexible. And yet we also have to be, have enough structure so that our client knows there is a way to do this, a way forward, a process. You know, it's not just willy-nilly, oh, whatever you want, wherever you want to go. Instead, a good coach can challenge people. You know, for example, if, if someone is trying to manage their stress and they're willing to do relaxation t- uh, training twice a week, a good coach is going to say, okay, you can do that, but is that going to give you the results you really want to do it only twice a week? So coaches are kind of this um, strange combination of tough and gentle, understanding Mm -hmm. and also willing to challenge and help someone really look and say, okay, if I really do want this, am I willing to go an extra mile here? Yeah. Yeah. That is a tough combination. And I want to go to your process in just a second. But what about the empathy? Because I know that some people can care too much and they take on the burden of mm-hmm. of everyone's problems, right? So what is oh. how can how can you still be empathetic but also have a have a line, right? Have have your boundaries. Oh. Study the concept of compassionate detachment. And Easier said than done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think any human helper, whether they're a therapist or whether they're a coach, discovers is that I can be with somebody and with them, right in there with them on some experience they're having, but realize that it is their experience. And if I take on their burden, it helps them no, in no way whatsoever, and it, it only burdens me. I had a client one time uh, when I was doing uh, my work as a psychologist, and I did about 25, 27 years or so of clinical work, and um, I had a client come in one time who had been 
really processing a lot of emotion for several sessions. And she was practically in tears saying, you know, I, I hate coming in here and, and dumping all this crap on you. And she felt really guilty about that. And I said, no, listen, you don't understand. It's like all this stuff that you're referring to, we just put this in a big wheelbarrow together and you and I take it down to the end of a dock and we just dump it. Now, when we dump it together, I don't say, wait a minute, let me go down underneath to where you're dumping it and then you can go ahead and, and you know, tilt the wheelbarrow and dump it. We just dump it together. And that helped her relieve that guilt and be able to really process what you needed to process. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like that. We have to see it as taking on that burden doesn't help. And we really do have to also be aware of our own burnout. You know, compassion fatigue is a reality. And if we are seeing one difficult client after another, after another, after another, we've got to stop for a second and say, no, wait a minute. Why am I setting myself up to just be working with really difficult clients who are processing really difficult things? Maybe I've crossed the line here. Maybe I'm playing at being a therapist instead of being a coach. Hmm. I better watch this. So. Talk more about that because that, I mean, I, I am a dietitian by training. I used to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions mm -hmm. and oftentimes some heavy stuff comes up, right? So what is that line? Like what is the line for a health coach to say, okay, maybe you need more help, right? From someone yeah. different <laughs> with right. that expertise. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that I was very involved with, with the National Board for Health Wellness Coaching is I chaired the committee that formed the... Um, the board's uh, code of ethics and scope of practice statement. And we really do have to have a scope of practice that recognizes we are not a therapist. Coaching is not therapy. It's not just about remedial fix-it kind of work. That's not really coaching. Coaching is about how can I help someone go from where they are to where they want to be. And yes, we are going to definitely encounter those heavy sessions and you know, the painful things that come up, but can the person process it, gain an insight, and put it into practice? Learn from that insight and do something with it. If they can, and they can kind of move through it like that, keep on coaching. But if they're just coming in and processing emotion, processing emotion, processing emotion, that's a big red flag. They, they probably benefit from counseling therapy instead of coaching, or maybe in addition to coaching at the same time. Or if they process, can never seem to get that insight, they just keep processing, or they get the insight, but they, and they can't do anything with it. They, they don't change behavior, they don't implement a new plan, they don't you know, make progress with anything. They can't keep coming back to that same stuck spot. That's another time where introducing the idea of coaching, or counseling rather, can really be important. And I'm assuming that you would, as a coach, you have a resource guide or a list of people going, hey, you can contact these people or the resources handy. Yeah, you know, the, the more personal you can make it, the better. Uh, I also wrote a blog on uh, referring people to a mental health professional using the stages of change. Because think about it. If uh, you and I are coaching and uh, we bring up this concept that you know, you might benefit better better from uh, counseling or maybe in addition to. The idea, as it's presented to you, you're probably not very likely to say, oh, what a swell idea. I'll just <laughs> run right out and do that. <laughs> you're probably going to be ambivalent, right? If you've been in therapy before, you probably know how much hard work it is. You're reluctant to roll up your sleeves and do that again. If you've never been in therapy, you may have all kind of preconceived notions that maybe it's more difficult than you think and different than uh, it really is. So you need to really help that person resolve that ambivalence. And this is where coaches, in, in, you know, actually uh, incorporate some of what we call motivational interviewing as well as one of the, the tools that we use. 
And uh, we help that person contemplate, should I, shouldn't I? Is it worth it? What do I need to do here? Then we help them prepare. And this is where that list of really well-known to you uh, good resources can really help. Do you have a list of the local people who are good at uh, couples uh, therapy, that are good at um, you know, helping someone who has abuse issues or whatever it might be that came up? Now, when you don't have that local list, you're coaching someone in uh, Nova Scotia and um, you know, you're in California, you can go online and help them find their way around. Is there a local community mental health center that I can start at? or whatever resource they need. But you stick with them. You don't abandon them. It just reminds me of, I had a business coach for a while and um, she, she was calling me on a few things I didn't do. She's like, well, let's do them right now. I was like, oh, okay. I guess we're doing this. But she sat there, <laughs> right there with me when I was typing those emails. I was like, yeah, all right. Yeah. It's kind of that accountability picture. There's someone, I mean, someone accountable too, but they're going to willing to, help you through the muck, you know, like, cause it, like you said, therapy is not easy to go through, but then it's even trying to wade through all of the resources and how to find someone oh. that can be intimidating enough. Oh yeah. And, and don't forget that most of the time, the uh, barrier that mental health wise, that we're going to be looking at is depression. And the number one symptom of depression is inability to concentrate. So talk about a catch 22 Here's a person that needs to work their way into an appointment schedule with somebody, and they lack the concentration to follow through and do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and they say to their coach, oh, yeah, I'll give, you know, that person you mentioned a, a call one of these days. That's not good enough. <laughs> right. right. Hey, we're going to do more like what you just talked about and kind of hold their hand a bit till they get it scheduled, have some accountability that, yes, I did go to the appointment and so forth, and help them, you know, make it from here to there. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things, I want to go back a minute. Um, one of the things you talked about is having, being flexible, but having some structure. And right. so you have a wellness mapping 360 process, and it may be proprietary, I don't know, but can you talk a little bit more about it um, to, to, to lend itself to that structure? Sure. Yeah, I explain that a lot in my, uh, my book, Wellness Coaching for Lasting Lifestyle Change. And um, it really is a matter, I call it Wellness Mapping 360 because we're helping someone look at their life 360 degrees, you know, all aspects of it. Not just, I want to lose 40 pounds and I want to get on a diet and exercise program and that's it. We're going to help them take stock of their wellness, look at their whole life because quite often people find that there's other things related to why they're stuck. And then it really is about creating a map or a plan. You know, if you want to get where you want to go, you got to create a good map to get there. And people really benefit from having that kind of structure, identifying areas of their life they want to improve. Then what are the goals that are going to help me improve that area? If I accomplish these goals, that area will be better. Now, one of the most important things about our method is we don't just stop at goals. There's a lot of goal setting out there that people always talk about. But there's another step involved in accomplishing goals. And that's what we call action steps. The action steps are the things that I make a commitment to do to improve, to accomplish that goal, rather. So, for example, um, a person wants to, let's say, attain and maintain a healthy weight. All right, so one goal is to become a lot more physically active. All right, that's the goal. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to begin by walking three times a week for 20 minutes at a time. Okay, those that's the action step. If I do that regularly enough, it's going to help me work toward accomplishing that goal. So we break it down like that and then help the person you know, help them decide. We co-create this whole plan. It's not a one-size-fits-all one type of deal here or something that we prescribe. Exact opposite. We co-create it with our client and then help them set up how they can be accountable to themselves to follow through. And it's flexible. It's changeable. You know, after a while, the person's able to walk more than just 
three times a week for 20 minutes. You know, if they really want to lose weight walking, they're going to have to walk a lot more than that. But we're setting up a process. We're establishing a habit, getting them started. And then we can help them increase the regularity or the frequency or the intensity of whatever it might be. Well, thank you for not talking about SMART goals. <laughs> <laughs> we go way beyond SMART goals. Yes, I cannot talk about SMART, smart goals <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so for both the, the coaches who are listening or the, the maybe future coaches, right? And then also for organizations to say, how do I hire the right coach? What are yeah. the processes to be certified? Because I think uh, my understanding is that there was just a new a change in certification or something like that. I am not a coach, so I don't understand it. So what are the processes to be certified as a health coach? Okay. So there's there's two levels of certification. One is the level that you get of certification from an organization that you do training with. And that certification certifies that you have successfully completed that training. For example, if you uh, complete a training from Real Balance, we certify that you know you've completed that training successfully. You might get a similar certification from one of the other leading health and wellness coaching organizations out there. Then there is the certification that comes from an independent third body, third party. And that, for example, would be the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching, or it might be the International Coach Federation. And to attain that kind of certification, you have to, number one, graduate from an approved program, a program approved by that independent body. And you usually have to meet other qualifications in terms of experience and perhaps taking an examination or having a recording examined and so forth. Once you attain a certification like that, that holds even more weight it's more recognized, you know, as uh, really something uh, of real value. Now, health and wellness coaches, because we do not provide treatment, don't have to be certified by anybody, okay? It's optional. It's desirable, but it's not legally required. And as a result, we sometimes have coaches out there that are uh, not the best coaches, not, not uh, <clears throat> all that well qualified. And that's where having a certification is kind of an immediate vetting that an organization can say, oh, well, you know, uh, they're a real balance coach. I know they're really, really good. Th- those are the kind of people we like to hear uh, or like to hire. Or, you know, they got their um, certification from the national board. So, wow, um, that means they really are a good coach. And so there's a real confidence that you've had really uh, top-notch training. And there's over 55 organizations that have been approved by the National Board. Oh, wow. I didn't realize there were that many. (laughs) Quite a few to pick from. There's a lot of competition out there. (laughs) Yes. Well, thank you for breaking that down. So people, if they want to get certified, can do that. Because yes, if you are going to hire a health and wellness coach, you w- I would assume you would want, an employer should be looking for some kind of cert- one of these certifications that you mentioned. Actually, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if I was in the employer's position mm-hmm. and I saw my uh, resume in front of me of, a, of an applicant, the number one thing I would look is say, okay, they got their training from organization ABC. Is ABC approved by the national board? If they're not, boy, I'm really going to be skeptical. So would you uh, go to the national board to find out who's approved? Is that the best avenue? Yeah, okay. their website has a complete list. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I can link that up in the show notes if people just want to go see uh, what is approved by the board. Yeah. yeah. NBHWC.org. Okay. They'll never remember that. I'll link it up in the show notes. (laughs) So, Michael, if we had to take all of your wisdom and your many years of experience in coaching, and if you had to boil it down to just one tangible tip for wellness practitioners to take away from our conversation, so coach or no coach, just a wellness practitioner working with an organization to kind of improve the well-being of their organization, what would that look like? I think it would be... 
most likely something as simple as really listen to what the people you're trying to help are saying, what they're saying about their lives, what they're saying about how easy or difficult it is to be well. Really get that that feedback. And don't just do it from one of those impersonal online surveys. Have real conversations. Help that person feel comfortable. Help them feel like they're not being judged for what they're saying. And really open up the conversation and find out what do they need and what's really getting in the way, what's making it easy to be healthy and well here, what's making it challenging to be healthy and well here. Good advice. Listening is always good advice <laughs> and getting that personal connection as well. Even if it's through Zoom, we can still do that and, and connect yeah. with folks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Michael, where can people find out more about you and your company? The website is uh, www, of course, uh, realbalance.com, realbalance.com. And uh, you can also take a look at uh, my book, Wellness Coaching for Lasting Lifestyle Change, and my new book that's going to be coming out at the beginning of the year, Masterful Health and Wellness Coaching, Deepening Your Craft. I will link all of that up in the show notes. And before we end, is there anything that you want to leave my listeners with that you didn't get a chance to say, or I might have missed asking? Hmm. You know, I guess I would say understand understand more about wellness. You know, the wellness field has been around since uh, the mid seventies, and wellness and health promotion, understanding that that profession and that field is really important. Don't think that coaching is just learning a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy and trying to pretend you're a coach. Uh, There's a lot more to it. If we're talking about health and wellness coaching, we really are talking about wellness. And I've been heavily involved in that field since practically the beginning of it. And it has accumulated a tremendous amount of information There's organizations like WellCOA, Wellness Councils of America, and other organizations. I I think another really great one to know about is the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and uh, all the information that they have about how we can be healthy and well. So reach out to organizations like that and find out more about what they have to teach you and really see wellness coaching as wellness. Very good advice. Well, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Fun talking with you. Thank you very much. There's been a lot of news and media attention lately about stress and job burnout. If you're trying to solve this problem with stress balls and those lovely stress dots that you get at health fairs that, you know, react with your skin and change colors, it's time to try a different approach. Redesigning Wellness offers an impactful resilience training that teaches employees how to thrive in the fast-paced, continuously changing environment that is corporate America. We take a multi-dimensional approach that not only includes the physical, but also emotional, mental, and spiritual dimensions. I love giving this training, and the feedback has been tremendous. For more information on resilience training, visit redesigningwellness.com.